You're listening to the UOR Music Podcast. Hello and welcome to the second episode of the Your Music Podcast. My name is James Smith and I'm joined as always by Ben Stone. Hello. Uh, it is lovely to see you again if you are listening or watching. Um, well, I suppose if you're listening, you're just hearing rather than seeing. Yeah. But still, it is lovely to know that you are there. Um, we hope that you are there. Yeah. How yeah. are you this week, Ben? I'm good. Good. Not much has changed from uh, from last week. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, same yeah. old, same old. Same old. How about you? Are you good? I, I'm tremendous. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Ben. Yeah. No, I'm just yeah. happy to be back yeah. recording. Um, it so sure has been a while. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's not like we record these in one go. No. I, I'm wearing a different jumper, so clearly not. Yeah. Yeah. Continuity. <laughs> um. We're talking about film this week. Mm. A bit about film, a bit of TV, maybe. Film composers. Yeah. Um, and film music in general, music in film. Uh, what are your thoughts, music and film, Ben? I mean... Kick us off. I love it. It's great. It's it, But if you just watch a film with no music, then it's sort of very dull. Imagine La La Land with no music. I wouldn't go and watch that. Yeah, I mean, La La Land is a bit of a different example. <laughs> <laughs> Music is quite crucial to that film. Yeah, I, I mean, if we go to something like Star Wars, of which we are fans of, um, I think without John Williams's scores, they wouldn't be w- what they are. Well, yeah, it's it's music is just. Ah, I do need. I don't think we really need to state it that much because I think people are aware of how important music is. But it is vital to mm. giving films their character, and certainly John Williams. We like to think of him as the daddy of kind of film music. We know he, he was the first to do that big, huge sort of symphonic sound, I'm pretty sure. Mm, it really made it feel grand um, for, 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 for the films that he did. Yeah, because, and yeah, it's just it just inspired that whole, mm. I think for me, it did add, it was one of the things that added to all that magic of Star Wars. Yeah. And, you know, when you've got that big fanfare at the start. Um, it's unlike anything else. We um we actually saw up in Edinburgh at the Fringe Festival. We actually saw a band called the Catet. We did they, indeed, they, yeah. They did and John Williams Funk. It was, it was very good. It's kind of a, a remix of all his greatest yeah. hits. Um, that was that was. I, that I was mean, really good. one of our personal highlights was one they called the Spielberger. Yeah, forty minutes long was it that uh, song? It, yeah, it was yeah. a it was an hour and a half concert with three pieces. Yeah, and our mouths were just open for the whole thing. It was great. I mean, John Williams is, is already great, but with funk, <laughs> so good. Um, and he inspired, you know, all of us. And then there's the other kind of, I, uh, what I'd refer to personally as the other staple of film music is Hans Zimmer. Mm. Um, you know, his, just, his whole portfolio is just unbelievable. You know, all of Chris Nolan's, Christopher Nolan's stuff, mm. the, those big films, the Batman, you know, the Dark Knight trilogy. Um, Inception. Blah. He was the first to do that, blah, which is now used in every film. Every trailer. every film trailer has that. <laughs> I'll I tell you what. I was watching this really interesting Hans Zimmer documentary the other day, and um, I found out <laughs> <laughs> for context, <laughs> this was a, a Hans Zimmer documentary made by me in, an A-level pro- a, as an A level project. <laughs> um, I I I'll, I'll I'll add a little bit of audio slash video here. Oh, I will definitely and, add the video. Yeah, in. <laughs> just a little snippet. <laughs> but oh. in that very in, insightful documentary, very professional documentary, um, you you mentioned that uh he didn't do the pirates cab parts of the Caribbean music, are so wrongly credited. Yeah, well, yes and no. Hmm. Um, he was so it originally went to. I'm tempted to say Alan Silvestri, but it might be someone else. Um, please don't email in. We're ex, but we're not ex. We're not experts <laughs> in any of this. So if we get it wrong, we get it wrong. Mm. Um, and then they approached Hans Zimmer, Disney. Yeah, but he was busy doing The Last Samurai. So that is a good film. That's a good film. So he said no. So they went to Klaus Van Van Delt. And he wrote what we now know as the iconic sort of 
We're going to get get, uh, copyright claimed. (laughs) Well, I think my singing is so awful (laughs) that (laughs) they won't actually recognise it. (laughs) But that that iconic Pirates of the Caribbean... uh, We owe Disney money now. ...sort of motif. uh, That was Klaus Bandel. And then the next films after that, I'm... I'm pretty sure he's still doing them. I'm not sure if he's doing, you know, whatever film, Pirates of Caribbean film we're on, 50,000. Margot Robbie's in the next one. Oh, is she? Yeah, she's taking the lead. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, but Hans Zimmer then took over for the next few films. But those kind of core motifs that we mm. all know and love, well, I say love. I, I do enjoy it, but I played it a bit too, one too many it's, times. It's the one that every concert band gets, every school concert band gets for their movie theme. It's yeah. Pirates. If you play the original score... Mm. Oh, unbelievable. Unbelievable. Are there any un- underrated film composers, do you think? I'd say there are, there are film composers that are either only known for one thing when they've done a lot more mm. or just not, you know, not really known. Uh, one of which is Danny Elfman. Oh, yeah. Because everyone associates him with The Simpsons, Simpsons theme. And Although Hans Zimmer did the movie theme, he did. Well, yeah. he did. Yeah, well, he wrote the music for the movie, but yeah, you didn't know that until I told you the other. Well, day. no, I watched on the very insightful documentary. So Danny Elfman, he's done all sorts of uh, films. You know, superhero films. Uh, he's done lots of Tim Burton films. Oh, so yeah. Nightmare Before Christmas, uh, Edward Scissorhands, Tim Burton Alice in Wonderland. Um, he also did the Batman and Batman Returns, nineteen eighty nine and nineteen ninety two. Is is that the one with uh, George Clooney's nipples? <laughs> Can we say nipples on the show? Um, I um, I might I may have to check, and this may not be in. <laughs> it was the Michael Keaton Batman. Ah, and he also and Danny Elfman, of course, did the Spider Man yeah. music for the original Spider Man trilogy. Well, speak. Carry on with sort of the with the um superhero theme. I mean, who doesn't recognise a classic Superman? Yeah, music. I mean, it music is one of those things in film where you can leave the theatre, and you could completely forget the plot. But you could have a tune just stuck in your head. Um, you know, he, he the theme. What was what, what's your favourite Superman movie? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, there is Superman Four: Crest of Peace, which was filmed in my hometown of Milton oh, Keynes. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Uh, but only one shot is actually filmed in Milton Keynes. Uh, oh, wh- and which shot was that? Would you happen to know? <laughs> it was Superman <laughs> flying over the <laughs> United Nations building. I'm getting everything in this episode, aren't I? Um, <laughs> luckily, I'm the one in charge of the edit. <laughs> um, <laughs> Silvestri's uh, Avengers music, especially in Endgame, I just remember sitting in that theatre for the first time seeing that film, you know, 11 years of hype for a film, and it's the portal scene and the, the portal's music, that track. It just it whilst you're sitting there and you're getting sort of all emotional with all the characters that you've sort of invested in over these years, and then suddenly this like massive sort of build up of fanfare, which starts very subtle, very quiet, sort of with the timpani and slowly they're walking through the portals, and then suddenly just grand to sort of go alongside the army. It's 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 insane. It, it really is builds. it is the thing that gives you the goosebumps. Yeah, like the the action on screen is very exciting, but it's that. I don't know when there's just a really powerful sort of chord or harmony, mm. and it, you you do genuinely get those sort of goosebumps. Another fun fact uh, for the title card of Endgame: the orchestra playing the theme at the beginning is only half an orchestra, because half the uh, half the universe have been snapped away. There you go. A fun fact. You learn something new every day. Yeah. Um. So straying <laughs> straying away from the the huge. Yeah. Let's go to the huge orchestrations. I also love an effective use of minimalist, and I think a really good example is not—it's not film, but it's the Line of Duty oh, soundtrack. Great show! It was a great show and great music, very powerful music and very sort of um, sparse music. And a lot of people aren't fully a kind of maybe wouldn't recognise it fully. I, they'd recognise the theme tune, but it's always there, and it's always this kind of tension of. Sort of mm. dum dum dum, low notes, um, and it's by Carly Paradis, and she is, you know, I, I, you asked me about underrated composers. She's someone who I would like to see composing a lot more music, uh, for film and TV because I think she does some really really good stuff. And her line of duty theme, we can't play it on here for copyright reasons, but if you go away and listen to it, mm. and it is just very powerful. And it's 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 very minimal, 
bit of piano. Um, I really like it. And it starts with these sort of twinkly tings. And it's it's just because it's a binge worthy show, it just the theme tune becomes something that you can just you just it gets you in the mood. It's how important <laughs> theme tunes are. Not in that mood, but in the in the sort of <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> the theme tune comes on and suddenly you're like, Oh my goodness, it's mm. line of duty time. What's what's coming next? Yeah. Um, I think is really good. What about there's also dangers though with binge worthy theme music to TV shows because if you think about The Office, I, I might make people very angry not right now. And I'm a big fan of The Office, both UK and US. But when you binge like the whole nine seasons of the US Office, and I, I again we can't share the theme because of copyright. But um, but when you binge the the full nine seasons of The Office and you hear that music again and again and again. It sort of it does drone into you slightly, and you do want to just skip the intro. <laughs> yeah, I think it's worth noting though that those shows, particularly sitcoms mm. of that caliber, were written in a time before binging. Yeah, they, they were, were never inter- go inter- out yeah. weekly, and the the theme music was written to be. And I think it would have still had that sort of slightly irritating effect, but it's it's also got purpose. Don't get me wrong, I, I like you the know, music. It's, it's sort of it's time. For, yeah. for this show, and but it's all those sitcoms: How I Met Your Mother, Friends. Um, Big Bang Theory, they've all got those theme tunes yeah. that you know and kind of hate yourself for knowing so well. I mean, the, it, it's good music, it's just it's just a lot of it. I like the Scrubs, the yeah. Scrubs intro. That's um, fun. Going back to sort of, I suppose, TV music, are you, you've you been watching The Mandalorian a lot lately. Oh, big, big, big fan. That is on, yeah, so on, online TV yeah. show. Disney Plus. Ludwig Göransson composes, uh, composes that show. And um, there's a whole like there's a whole extra like documentary series on the side, so you can see how they make the show. And there's a whole episode on the music, and it's it's amazing because an entire TV theme music came from a bass recorder, an instrument that I didn't even think existed. I just thought recorders were like those things you had <laughs> at school. And uh, those of you watching <laughs> on the video, I'm I'm, uh, I'm sorry for my attempt of mimicking a recorder. Uh, no, you just see him with a big bass recorder doing the do 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 do. The point of the Mandalorian, for people who don't know, it's it's star, it's another Star Wars spin-off. Yeah. Um, and it's kind of, but it's they've they sell it as a um so, space spaghetti western. Yeah, yeah, that's what it is. Yeah. Um, so it the music draws a lot of influences from the work of Ennio Morricone, whether he intentionally was drawing influences from Murakami or not, it mm. certainly is there. So from those classic films, you know, The Good, Bad, The Ugly, Fistful of Dollars, those sort of things, um, yeah. which are, uh, by all means, iconic. Um, and some of my favourite music is Spaghetti Western uh, theme tunes, those sort of cowboy. So there's just something about it that makes you feel very mm. heroic, makes you feel, if you listen to it, I, I am a self-confessed film music nerd. I will sit there <laughs> and I will listen to film music in my headphones just to chill. Oh, yeah. And if I sit there and that's the beauty, I think, of all film music is I can sit there and I like to... You, te- you like to go off in your own daydream mm. and see yourself as that sort of character. Like if it's Morricone or sort of the Mandalorian music, you feel like you're some sort of outlaw mm. walking through the desert. Or if you listen to some really heroic music, like the Avengers music we were talking about earlier, you feel like you could be, a, you imagine yourself being some sort of hero. Listen to some sad music. We we haven't really touched on it, but the power of sad music. Yeah. When you're when 100%. you're sad, listen to sad. If you, <laughs> this is bad <laughs> advice. When, but if if you're sad or if you feel like having a bit of a cry, mm. listening to some sad film music really really adds <laughs> adds to that. Um, but um. You know, just to build up Goranson's reputation a bit more, um, not only has he done the sort of spaghetti western music for for Mandalorian, he's also uh, he did the music for Tenant, uh, Tenet, which just came out. Oh, that's um, the new Christopher Nolan. That's the new Christopher Nolan one. He's done Creed. Um, I think he did the music for Venom as well, and uh, I'm pretty sure he won an Academy Award when he did the the the, um, the score for Black Panther, not the soundtrack for Black Panther, because I can't remember who did the soundtrack for Black Panther. Um, but he did the score for like the main theme. Yeah, I think it'll be worth talking about in the future. We'll do an episode on um, soundtracks of films, sort of yeah. songs and featuring artists, because I think that's a whole other ball game. And I, we, sh- 
Yeah, we and should I, definitely do a sequel to this. <laughs> we should do a sequel. Uh, film episode, whatever we're calling this episode, to Electric Boogaloo. Yeah. Because um, I think also <laughs> it is worth touching on um, music, films about music. Yeah. So whether that be something like La La Land, which is a musical film. Yeah. Or Whiplash. Example, oh, Whiplash. Which is <laughs> is a cracking film. Um, it's great to watch when you're actually in a big band because yeah. it's sort of fun to point out stuff. So just for <laughs> those who haven't seen it, Whiplash is, um, came out a few years ago um, and it basically follows the story of a drummer in a prestigious music college over in America um, who makes it into the kind of the top band with a bit of an unorthodox uh, leader. Uh, a very angry J.K. Simmons. Yeah, which is what what more could you ask for? Yeah, and uh, it's it's just following kind of you know he this this drummer is determined to be the best, mm. um, and that is just an incredible film to watch. But it also puts you off playing in <laughs> could put you off playing <laughs> yeah, in a big it, band. It's not like that in real life. life. It's um, <laughs> yeah, our big band leader is is nothing like that. No, he's a lovely man, but um. You know, there's there's theme, there's films about music like Whiplash and La La Land, or La La Land's more of a a film musical, not a musical on stage that's gone to film, but a film musical. But um, you've got stuff like uh, Bohemian Rhapsody and Rocket Man coming out uh, that came out recently, and they take very different approaches to uh, sort of making a biopic about a famous musician's life. So you've got the Bohemian Rhapsody one where it's more of a a story that follows to an extent accurately his um Freddie Mercury's life. But Rocket Man on the other hand is more of a fantasy film, using the music to tell the story in a more fantastical way, more about the person and the emotion that he's that uh, Elton John went through. Yeah, and I think both have their merits and both have their kind of accuracies and inaccuracies, mm. but it's film at the end of the day. Um and I think but I think Especially the rescoring in Rocket Man of Elton John's hits is just in- unbelievable. And Taron Egerton, I, I just think he's just such perfect casting. He he also sang uh, Elton John. He, it was not the first film that he sang an Elton John hit in though, because he's he, in the it was animated film. Was it Sing? He played oh, a gorilla. Yeah, that sings. Uh, I'm still standing. He actually sang your song for his audition for drama school. I heard. Hmm. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a little bit funny, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to bring up also. A slightly different genre of sort of using music, putting rather than a film with music added, music with video added. So, for example, Black is King, that mm. was Beyonce's project, yeah, came out earlier this year, which fantastic, beautiful. Um, but that I'd I'd say that that was rather than it's almost as if it was the reverse. So it was about the music, but then the video track was added to complement the music, not the other way around. Mm. And because of that, the video was, had more artistic license, I think, to be more expressive because it was following the expression of the music and the music wasn't having to build up the visuals. So yeah. it was very interesting. It made the whole thing have a different approach, which was really, really good to see. Gonna have to leave it. Day K Simmons. Yes. <laughs> Day K Simmons. <laughs> So this week we are joined by Day Lee, accomplished drummer and musical director of the University of Reading Big Band. Hello Day, how are you? Yeah, I'm really good, thanks. Thanks for having me. How are you guys? Yeah, good, thank good, you. Good, yeah. uh, Welcome to the UOR Music Podcast. Um, so like I just said, you are the musical director of the University of Reading Big Band. You have been for a year now, just over a year. What would be kind of your little sum up review of that year how do you think it's gone uh i mean i have been here for a year but technically probably only here for about nine months or so because of you know what um a summary uh yeah i mean when i took over the band uh which was i think we auditioned for it in kind of mid-summer or early summer uh 2019 and uh i got the impression that it had so much potential but not necessarily kind of had been taken care of 
uh, as as well as it could have been. Um, the repertoire was okay, but it wasn't covering the, you know, some of the iconic uh, charts. Uh, I would say that any kind of uh, big band should play, regardless of whether they're amateur or pro. Um, and yeah, it was just really exciting to take take on the role. Uh, and uh, it's been amazing to see how the band sort of flourished. Um, I can't take credit for that, really. I, I think I think every every member sort of sort of uh, took it upon themselves to improve the band. And yeah, it's 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 really nice to start again uh, after that long gap. Uh, it's, start, it's nice to start again this year uh, with a whole a whole new band, really. Yeah, because it has kind of been we've had a, a lot of members kind of leave and graduate and so we have kind of had to bring in a new members but we've been quite lucky this year i think we, mm. we there was a bit of kind of will we won't we get anyone coming in i mean this leads me on to uh, the question that i've been dying to ask you who's your favorite member <laughs> <laughs> dil raj <laughs> he'll love that oh. <laughs> Um, he'll love that wouldn't yeah, he he'll be, li- he'll be listening in <laughs> his labs love it. he'll be listening to his labs uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> I had my bets on uh, Max to be honest oh um, yeah I think he's a, a he's legend. an insane double oh legend. I mean I don't have favourites guys <laughs> I don't have favourites <laughs> but I am a dr- I am a drummer and he is a bassist so it's just a natural yeah. natural pairing that isn't it let's talk a little bit about you Day um so what what is your sort of your your background in music where did it all start for you on the uh on the old drums i suppose or was it did it start on the drums it it didn't actually i actually started learning the piano as a very very young child with a very strict teacher who if i kind of look back in hindsight i wouldn't really rate as a musician now um they were really strict, really kind of, you know, sucked the joy out of music making. Uh, and I quit. I got to about, I didn't do grade one, but I got to about grade one, two level and I sacked it off. But the theory was there. I used to have little theory lessons with my siblings after, after our lessons as well. Um, but that foundation was sort of established, which was useful, I guess. Um, and then I can't really remember, but I, it was still when I was quite young, I was always into the idea of being able to play an instrument, especially the drums and guitar. Um, and I'd love to say that my first kind of inspiration or like my first favorite band was this, you know, like Herbie Hancock's, you know, what Chick, Chick Corea's electric band, whatever. But it was actually busted. Uh, and uh, I, I was obsessed with the, I don't know if you know, I don't know how well you know the band, but you know, they do the jump with the, every time they go into a chorus, they do a jump. And I used to get a tennis racket and go in front of a mirror and, and try to jump with them, uh, listening to them. When, when it came on TV, obviously, because YouTube wasn't invented. So it was on when MTV was on or whatever. And whatever. Yeah, I can't, I can't remember the channel, but um, I used to do that. Um, and then, yeah. I'd, and then the drums came really late, really, really late. I was always into the idea, sort, sort of self-taught. I was lucky enough to that we, were, we had some lodgers at some point. One of our lodgers was a Korean guy who was visiting. He was a drummer and he was visiting the UK and he had like this SPD electric drum box thing. Um, and he left that with me while he went back to Korea for the summer. So I had that to mess around with, taught myself just by ear, but all wrong, obviously, but, you know, got the rhythm, basic rhythm that he lent me a pair of sticks, gave me some for my birthday. He was kind of my first like mentor, I guess. Um, and then it really, my, my first lesson was really late when I was like 13. Um, and it was a deal between me and my parents uh, in that I'd only get lessons because we weren't wealthy or anything like that. So they, they basically said, they'll give me lessons if I get into this school. And it was a grammar school, so I had to do the 11 plus and everything. And I scraped in, <laughs> like absolutely scraped in um, and reminded them a year or two in being like, hey, actually, where's my, where's my, you know, where's, where's my drum lessons? So they got me drum lessons in the end. Um, still didn't have an instrument or anything for years, but but um, I was so lucky to have Clark Tracy, uh, who's, who's son of, uh, well, I mean, Clark Tracy in his own right, best, one of the best um, jazz drummers uh, at the time and, and still now. Um, and his dad is uh, Stan Tracy, the house pianist of Ronnie Scott's for years. Um, just just an absolute uh, godfather of, of jazz um, in, the British, in the British scene anyway. 
Uh, and yeah, that's that's kind of how it all started. Quite late. I'm getting the impression that kind of from the start, I think jazz must have been kind of a big part of your 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 drumming sort of influence. You you weren't kind of going into it thinking, oh, I'm going to be. I mean, I know you talked about busted, but you weren't thinking, oh, I'm going to be a, a rock drummer. It was kind of I'm going to be a, a jazz drummer. Or yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Jazz was definitely one of my first kind of uh, kind of in, in, inspired genres. Can I say that? Um, I guess I didn't really know what genres were really because I wasn't really I mean other than those a few piano lessons when I was a kid I was all self-taught and um actually I forgot to say that I I was guitar was the first instrument I probably taught myself a few years before I picked up the drums so I was just all completely self-taught and um uh it's interesting you say the whole jazz thing because yes Clark Tracy was the the person who kind of uh put me towards that direction but I was I was an absolute beginner he wasn't going to go here we go let's do some jazz he was he was just teaching me the drums you know so he didn't i i knew who he was and i you know i'd stalk him on on youtube and the stuff like that you know go on his website and everything but but he didn't really know that i was into it at all um what was what's really funny is i don't know if you i'm i'm guessing you you know the show friends we are aware of it um, yeah. <laughs> just, just a small show i, I don't i don't know if you, how i don't know <laughs> i don't know how well you know it but um there's an episode and it's happened a couple of times but this is this is one this is a key one um there was an episode where Joey accidentally tells Trigger, the kind of caretaker janitor guy, um, that Monica's uh, living illegally in her in her grandma's apartment, and obviously he's trying to get out of it. And Trigger basically kind of blackmails him into saying, "Look, I won't do anything. I won't. I won't say anything. But you're going to be my dance partner because because uh, I've got a date with this girl, and, and I really want to, you know." impress her and i don't have a partner to practice with anyway long story short the last scene where they where they're on the rooftop of the block um they they do this dance and, and the and the backing track is i don't think it's sinatra but it's like a ripoff uh but it's a great uh, i think a neil hefty arrangement of night and day which is a cracking we should we should absolutely play that ben you can sing as well um it's it's big band all all over um and and uh, obviously at the time I didn't even know what jazz was. I didn't know what big band was, but I liked that sound. And in the open day of the school, the big band was playing. Uh, this is this is the, the, the grammar school I went to. Um, the big band was playing then as well, and I think they were playing that chart or they were playing a similar chart. I mean, they all sound the same, right? And uh, and I just went, yeah, that whatever that is, sign me up. And obviously Clark Tracy, jazz guy. I started looking into jazz and found all that music and just. You know, it's like finding a treasure, right? As a kid who who didn't have any idea what he what it was that he loved, you know. But um, yeah, that that's how I kind of started out with the whole jazz thing. So, who would be your biggest influences as you're playing today, uh, sort of at your gigs and when you're working with bands? What's what what's inspiring you at the moment? Um, I mean, at the moment, absolutely nothing, um, because there is nothing. But um. <sighs> I mean, we need we need an extra hour on on this on this answer. But in short, um, I have many kind of classic drummer in kind of drummers to, that I aspire to. Like uh, for me, it's Steve Gadd, um, Jeff Hamilton, Vinnie Colluta, Jeff Beccaro, Bernard Purdy. I mean, it, the list just goes on. But but if 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 you know these guys, you'll you'll get the feeling that. Um, they're groove players um or do it all players and that's what i like some people really like the kind of brian blade sort of thing and and uh, mark juliana sort of thing and they're fantastic but for me it's it's groove and it's pocket um but at the same time it's probably my my teachers that i kind of aspire to because you're, you're you're week in week out you see them and you hear them play and you're going well that's what i want to play like so so that sticks with you and a lot of the times when i'm doing a fill or I'm, I'm writing a film on a show or whatever, I'm thinking, what would this guy do? Because I, I actually know him, you know, I, I, I've had that experience, whereas I wouldn't know what what Steve Gadd would have done. I could probably try fake it, but, you know, it, it's, there would be no point, basically. Because um, only he sounds like him. And I think it's like Miles Davis was the one who said, um, man, it's so hard to sound like yourself. Right. And so I think that that's another thing. You know, you don't always want to copy what other people sound like. You kind of have to f find what sounds good to you, which 
therefore means that that's you know that's how you sound you know yeah because we spend so much of our time quite rightly in big bands you know listening and feeling like we've got to kind of try and emulate or or, or not necessarily emulate but you know channel a certain sort of style and sound and then kind of but what you're also coming in there is also saying you've got to do that but simultaneously throw your own spin on it and put your own sound in there i i agree i think again it's something we just talk about for hours but in a in a big band setting you have to channel the arranger uh if, is it a vocal then that's a whole different thing is it a feature um the rhythm section has a different sound to a horn section and i, I sound a bit biased to that but in that but the the rhythm section does have more flexibility to sound like that rhythm section like the wind and kelly trio you know it's Wynton Kelly Tree, Oscar Peter Tree. You know it's Oscar Count Basie's rhythm section. You know it's Freddie Green, and you know whoever the drummer is. You could just sat, hear that. Whereas, a uh, four trombones, you might hear that's the Basie section, but you might not know th- these these were the members, um, who the members were. You know, um, so yeah, in a big band setting, I think I think there's a lot more things to consider. Whereas if you're in a small band setting, you can really let loose and do you. Um, but it's just a, it's, you're just communicating with the others, aren't you? It's just a conversation uh, in a small band setting. I mean, we we've only really known you in in sort of obviously as as a leader of the big band. But do you in do you enjoy that kind of the more intimate jazz side of things? I love it. I I love playing small band stuff. I must confess, I think I'm more of a as a player, I'm more of a big band player. And as a genre i get i mean there's so much big band stuff out there so much small band you can't just box it but i would say on the whole i listen to big band music a lot more it's just what i'm drawn to um maybe the fact that i was kind of i had the whole orchestral background as well um and i quite liked the ensemble thing that's kind of here we go go out and do it um but yeah no i love small band playing i'm just i just don't think i'm i think i'm a better better big band player than a small band player uh, just because I do it more and I prefer to play it. Was there a moment, was it say at school or at university where you decided this is going to go from, you know, my drumming is going to go from a hobby of what I do for fun to this is what I want to do as my career. Was there like a defining moment where you thought that or was there something that made you think, you know what, this is it. i am just got to do this because for me with my trumpet playing, I love it and I considered doing it, but I just thought I don't want to lose my you know the the fun and the passion by turning it into my um my my livelihood and depending on it. Oh, okay, that's really interesting. I mean, I I just wanted to m- make my livelihood a ho- hobby, what I do all the time, and and earn my living that way. But um, but yeah, no, um, gosh, really good questions because I haven't thought about this in a long time. There are two defining moments. Um. One of them is probably on paper more like whoa than than the other, but for me it was equal. Um, when I was sixteen, so about year eleven, going into A level, already had chosen my A levels, and music was a part of that. Um, I just heard, I don't know what I think it was after a concert. So I, I used to be part of Thames Youth Orchestra, which was a huge part of my musical upbringing. Um, I would go into that, but it's it's very long. But essentially, they gave me my first kind of orchestral and jazz kind of uh, experience. And I was lucky in terms of the timing of things with drummers leaving and things like that. Um, I was essentially the last resort. Um, but uh, yeah, I was incredibly lucky to, to work with them. And the conductor and the, the leader um, and founder, uh, Simon Ferris, who is a good friend now, um, we, after a concert, back in the day when you could do this, uh, all the staff and the students just went to a curry. We just went for a curry, you know, um, after the concert. And that's that was the thing that we did after a big orchestral concert. And it was there was nothing, you know, if you do that now, it's like, oh, you know, whereas it was, it was absolutely fine back, in, back, back then. And um, uh, Simon just mentioned something my percussion coach, Ben, ben Porter, uh, had said, uh, something about, oh, oh, yeah, we were talking the other day and uh, Ben reckons you could probably go pro. You know, that was it. And I went, oh, okay. And then, you know, but obviously I acted like, oh, yeah, okay. But inside, yeah, you got to be cool. Okay. So I've got, you know, yeah, (laughs) Yeah. like, you know, big, big, big boost of confidence there because I I was too afraid to even think about the prospect of it. Um, uh, And yeah, and and then the second one was I went to a a jazz course 
And a very long story short, um, uh, one of my favorite pianists, um, I haven't worked with him since actually, um, not that I was working with him then, I was a student then, uh, but I was kind of a lower sixth and uh, he, he's an oh, unbelievable pianist, really lovely guy. And he was, in, he was mentoring our group and uh, he said, also, oh, what are you going to do after, after school? And at the time I thought I was going to do Mechenge at, at Imperial or something. Um, and uh, I said, I, I said, I think I'm going to do some engineering course. And I went, oh, okay, that's a shame. I think, you know, maybe do the music thing. And I just thought this Dave Newton guy, he's a good pianist, whatever. I went back to the next week, went back to school in my lesson. And my teacher, Oz, was there like, oh, mate, like, um, how was, how was it? And I was working with, how was, you know, how was Dave Newton, you know? And I was there like, oh, it's funny you should mention him. I, he just said, yeah, he said that I should, I should go into music or something. And he was there like, if Dave Newton said that, then you might want to, you might want to consider it, kid, uh, sort of thing. Uh, and, and that was kind of the defining moment for me. Uh, I kind of knew, knew that was uh, going to, and, and Oz, my teacher, just helped me out and is still helping me out so much throughout my career. Um, yeah, I would not be where I am at all without the help of Oz, Simon, and a, lo a load of these cats, basically, that help us out. See, that's really interesting because I don't think I, I could... Uh putting the other practice in order to to actually get to to a, a level where someone could say yeah you'll be all right <laughs> i'll just be, uh, be too lazy <laughs> that's your laziness though yeah. ben <laughs> is there a, a point in your career so far that you would consider this you know say it was a gig or getting asked to play with someone and you were sat there doing that gig or that performance and you thought to yourself wow this this is the highlight. This is, you know, this is the big time. I've really kind of made it. There's definitely not been a point in my career where I thought I've made it. Um, it's interesting, actually, that the whole concept of, oh, if I do this, I would have said I made it because I've had so many of those goals. And thankfully, a lot of them have been, well, some of them have been kind of reached and I'm still wanting more and I don't feel satisfied. But I think that's everyone. I think that's just life. Um, so hopefully I don't ever feel like I've made it. Otherwise, that's where you start getting a bit stale and stagnant. You know, you're, you're playing playing wise and attitude wise. But um, uh, yes, I, I have a few. Not I mean, not many. But, so the first one um, is probably Panto because um, I've been sitting it. So Ozzy, ha, Ozzy moved on, my old teacher, and he handed me the gig and it was it was quite scary because uh, the MD who did it last year, and last year was my first year of doing it. Um, the MD has his drummer. A lot of MD has their musos, right? And he really wanted to get get his drummer in. And um, the fixer Gary Hind is extremely loyal. So it's like whoever got in after Ozzy has got it for the next 20 years sort of thing, right? As long as they, you know, as long as Gary likes him, obviously, it's not, it's not, it's not a given, but he's extremely loyal. And um, Ozzy fought my corner. And uh, I had to really prove myself to Barry. Barry was the loveliest man in the world. I mean, I cannot, I can't even imagine why he was, um, why I was intimidated to, to meet him uh, other than the fact that he's an amazing MD. But um, yeah, that one, I've been sitting in on that for 10 years. So since I was 15 or whatever, um, I, every year I sat and just, I don't watch the panto, I just watch Ozzy. And he is king, he is king of all of that stuff. Um, playing timps and xylo and drums and whistles and, and gong at the same time. And I kind of had to attempt to do that um, last year and, and, you know, got away with it. Um, that's one. And, that, and Wimbledon's obviously a big panto, so I was really happy to, to have that. Um, another one was uh, when, going back to Thames Youth Orchestra, one of, my, one, of our, one of my first ever gigs was at the Royal Albert Hall a part, as a part of um, the, uh, what's it called? Youth Proms, BBC Youth Proms, I think junior proms junior proms that's what it's called um and it it was amazing obviously because i used to go to the proms with my sisters now and again uh and to play on that stage was amazing and then at the end there was like an 18 year old drummer about to go to music college playing the last piece on the kit and all the percussionists just had us there clapping because we had nothing else to do for the big hurrah with all the schools playing together and i i was just staring at the drummer just going one day that'll be me sort of thing and um obviously we're all out hall to get a gig as a pro um is a big achievement in itself and it was about a year and a half ago uh they would funnily enough i was hired in as a pro to play 
for the youth proms basically <laughs> so it was like this kind of perfect circle uh, and i was that guy and hoping that you know there was loads of these little kids that are standing behind me clapping shaking their maracas ho- hoping that they they might you know be inspired and, and and want to want to you know be there one day um so that was a really big one for me and lastly it's probably the biggest on paper um i got to work with this amazing con- uh uh, composer and uh, writer called George Fenton. Uh, if you don't know him, look him up. Um, he does loads for BBC. I think he's done quite a few for uh, Attenborough and stuff like that. Um, the project in itself was really cool, but um, essentially uh, it was this earth orchestra thing that had, oh, I'm not going to go into it, but it was just the most epic or, or, orchestral piece that we we were a part of and a bit of kit kit as well um and that was all done at abbey road studio too which is i reckon the first like number one on my on my list ever um so i i got i ticked that off the box um quite early actually which was really lucky but um yeah i'm not complaining so yeah so that 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 one was is my third that's insane. The, yeah, three very much oh. yeah, incredible examples. One um, day we'll host this podcast from Abbey Road Studios. Yeah, just you wait. Maybe. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> only, only, uh, only slightly disappointed that he didn't mention the Big Bang. Oh yeah, the Big Bang. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, God. Or, yeah. Or, I'll take that to heart. Or getting to work with the likes of me. We'll we'll never let you forget this. <laughs> oh, you know, you we'll, guys we'll know that's a you given. Forget. You know that's a given. <laughs> of course we are joking. Uh, um, uh, I, I'm not. I'm not joking. I don't know what we talk. About. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Working with Ben is the low light of my career. Oh, oh uh, yeah. <laughs> I'll just go cry. <laughs> <laughs> What's your biggest pet peeve? Because I know you teach drums as well as running the big band. What's your biggest pet peeve from either a student or a band member turning up to a, a, a lesson or a rehearsal? dishonesty i know it sounds really corny but if a student has hasn't practiced just tell me you know oh, mate i'm not gonna lie i haven't practiced i'll go okay thanks thanks for letting me know and rather than spend 15 minutes trying to prove that you did you know or or you know in a rehearsal someone turns up late and they've got this rubbish excuse she's like man you just you just you just messed up man just just sit down and play your trombone felix you know <laughs> I love that point so much. I just had to, I had to slip him in there somewhere. Beyond uh, big band, has we got any anything coming up? Uh, yes, um, we have. I actually have three gigs in December. That that's all been postponed from November, um, which is a real bummer, obviously. But thankfully, it got rescheduled very quickly. Um, that they are all big band. It's a big twenty-seven piece ensemble, so it's big band with an orchestra with, with a with a string section. Um, I'm actually on percussion for it, so loads of vibes playing and stuff like that um, at the Cadogan Hall, um, Dorking Hall, um, and that's it. No, it's two gigs, two gigs and a rehearsal. That's what it was. Yeah, um, yeah, that should be really exciting. Is this going to be your first gig, like live gig since lockdown? Or I had one. I had one in June with Shane Hampshire. Yeah, what was that feeling like when you we were able to walk out and do? do it live again the the best and worst feeling the, obviously it's best it was amazing because i got i got to play in front of people and there was obviously loads of people there because everyone wants to be out and you know it's outdoor gig amazing playing the music that i love reduced reduced kind of big band arrangements for small piece small piece band um but at the same time i felt so rusty man so rusty so i did i couldn't really enjoy it you know i was thinking too much and then all of a sudden the gig was done and I'm like, oh crap! I should have just, you know, stopped worrying about it. Because we're doing film film week, I was just going to quickly ask whether whether or not you thought Whiplash was an accurate representation of your rehearsals. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Spot on. <laughs> Spot on. It is exactly like that. <laughs> um, no, um, we are going to have to leave it. Day K Simmons. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Day K Simmons. <laughs> <laughs> that is the best joke that has been made on this podcast and it's not made by one of us two so we are going to have to leave it there day but thank you so much for talking to us we will have you on again if you would like to come on again because there are uh, a lot of other things i think 
we'd like to uh, pick your brains about. Um, mm. Certainly a lot of jazz. Sure, yeah, about. absolutely. Well, love to. Thanks um, for having me. Yeah, no, we'll do when we when we come around to doing our jazz big band weeks. We'll uh, definitely have you back on. Uh, but otherwise, thank you very much, Daily, uh, for appearing on the UOR Music Podcast. Um, we will put links to some of Day's work and otherwise just check out. Uh, you're on your Instagram social media, Daily Music. Is that right? Yeah, Daily Drums, yeah. Daily Drums. So go and check it out. He's got lots of uh, nice little videos on there. Otherwise, thank you very much, Day. We'll... Oh, thanks for having me. That's it for the Your Music Podcast for this week. Um Thank you very much for watching and slash or listening. You're very welcome. Um, not you, Ben. Oh, okay. Uh, we will see you at uh, the same time next week. Uh, whatever you're up to, I hope you have a wonderful rest of your week. Uh, I hope you're all staying safe and we will see you next time.